Hi there and welcome to another interview. Today I've got the fabulous Carnival Ray with me and I'm going to ask him the same question ask absolutely everybody. Hey Ray, why did you become Carnivore? Stephen, great to meet you. Yeah. I, well, I first heard about Carnivore watching a podcast of Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson. And I love both of them. Joe Rogan I find very entertaining. Jordan Peterson, somebody that when I hear him talk, I just admire him. His brain is light years past mine and so i usually got to slow it down and they're both talking about the benefits they've experienced you got jordan talking about how him and his daughter michaela had a slew of health issues autoimmune issues and depression and i mean just everything to the nth degree just very severe forms of any possible issue that somebody could have they had at times 10 and the depression piece in particular really resonated with me and so you have them who are bedridden for you know months at a time with depression and you know I've, I've struggled with depression from an adolescent age never bedridden but it, you know bad enough that life feels horrible right and so I'm thinking well there's no way this is real but if it is that's that's pretty dang cool and then you know Joe Rogan's talking about how I think he had some sort of pain in his body, went away. He lost weight pretty quickly. I think he lost some 12 pounds in a month. And I'm I'm 295 pounds at this point. So I, I definitely have weight that I can afford to lose. And I'm thinking, this sounds nuts. There's no way this is actually healthy. But if somebody like Jordan Peterson's willing to talk about it publicly, I don't, I don't think that's a man that would talk about something so controversial so flippantly. And so figured I'd try it. I didn't think I'd stick to it. My genuine thought is that I would attempt it. And within the first few days, I'd cheat. I'd have some ice cream or, you know, whatever, a box of pizza or fill in the blank with whatever kind of food we got here in America. Um, I try it. Day one, I feel normal. I'm enjoying the food. The food's really good. Day two, I feel normal, not good, not bad. Day three, I wake up and I get out of bed. And my knee doesn't hurt. And I've had knee pain for over a decade. I had 60% of my meniscus removed. And I'm talking, this is the first time in 12 years that I've climbed out of bed and didn't have a single bit of pain. And there were days that were, you know, better than others with that knee pain, but I didn't have any pain. I did this with my knee, lifted it all the way up. And I'm like, no, something's, what? What's going on here? And so I noticed that was kind of cool. I get to the office and I start working and I keep working and I keep working and I keep working and I am dialed in. I, you would have thought that somebody gave me some kind of stimulant that said, hey, this is going to allow you to use your full brain. And what's crazy about that, I'm somebody who has always thought brain fog was not real. I thought that's a word that people made up that... If somebody has a short attention span, they're just going to claim that it's this. And it's kind of just somebody that lacks willpower or motivation. Well, for the last two months prior to feeling this this day, I just, I couldn't focus. I'd grab my phone, open Instagram, close it. Open TikTok, close it. Open Facebook, close it. Reopen Instagram, close it. Reopen Instagram again. I was just on Instagram. I couldn't do a task at work longer than 60 seconds. And I'm not, I think I got up from my desk, from my office this day once to go use the bathroom and, and it dawns on me probably six hours in, and I'm like, should I go for a walk or something? What's going on here? Mental acuity, really nice, but the mental health as somebody who has struggled with depression from a very early age, I just felt good. There were no, there were no issues in life. And if there was an issue, I could fix it. And if I couldn't fix it, it wasn't mine to worry about. And so most of the experience, the experiences, the benefits that I've had from carnivore, I experienced them very early on. Now, the weight loss, I, I think I'd lost maybe five pounds at this point. I felt skinny. No, no inflammation, no bloating, no nothing. I definitely was not skinny. But I, you, you couldn't convince me otherwise. I felt very skinny in day three of carnivore. 
Well, fast forward to my 30 day point, which gosh, only a handful of times in life have I stuck with a diet for 30 days without some kind of cheat meal. I'm down 35 pounds, which is incredible. Now I'm a big believer that you can lose weight doing just about anything. Okay. I think carnivore, it's very easy to, um, I've lost a lot of weight before doing a whole foods diet, 40% carbs, 40% protein, 20% fat. It was not this quick. It was five, 10 pounds here, five, 10 pounds there, and a whole lot of working out. I was working out doing carnivore. 35 pounds is just so much weight to, to lose. So then thinking, this is insane. Like I gotta, I gotta tell somebody about it. So it's the downside to carnivore. You, you can't not talk about it. And so I, I make this video and I'm thinking, you know, next to nobody's going to see it. I share it with my personal Instagram and I share it with, uh, TikTok, which I, I I'm at this point, I don't post on TikTok. TikTok's just something to watch funny or educational content. And the video ended up getting some million views. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. You know, this, I've never had this happen before. Wow. Cool. I've got, you know, 5,000 followers. That's wow. And I, I keep answering people's questions because a lot of people are intrigued. This guy lost 35 pounds. I'd love to lose 35 pounds. How'd you do it? What'd you eat? How'd you feel? And, you know, is there anything I can do or can't do? What can you drink? And I just kept answering those questions and kept answering. And the longer I did it, the more I learned from personal experience and just from people reaching out and sharing their own experience. And then through doing more research and, you know, finding different accounts and okay, okay, this, this is why this happens. And that's why that happens. And in total, I ended up losing like 92 pounds. And so I went from, I went from 295 to I'll be anywhere between 203 to 210, depending on the day, depending on how much I eat, you know, the, the prior, the prior week. But it's been the first year that I've gone since having mental health issues and that, that developed around 11 or 12 years old. And, and I've taken antidepressants successfully before. And when I got to a good place, I, I got off them and it just came right back. And the knee pain had the surgery at 14. I'm, I'm 27 now. It, it's been the first full calendar year, 365 days where I didn't have a single bit of knee pain and I didn't have a single bit of depression. And for anybody that struggled with either of those two things to go an entire year without that, that's nuts. That is, that's bonkers. And so it's one of those things that what kept me talking about it is that it's changed my life so much and I'm, I'm very thankful for that not just outward but inward just who i am and how i view life it's changed me so much that considering that when i look at other people's testimonies mine's nothing people with lifelong ailments and, and diseases and issues that they've tried every pill known to man and no doctor's been able to diagnose or whatever. They're spending thousands of dollars a month just to, to fill their prescriptions. And all of a sudden they hop on this crazy, doesn't make sense, controversial diet and they feel better or it goes into remission or it's, it's gone. That's, it wouldn't be a crime against humanity to not talk about it. And so that's a little, that's a little backstory behind, behind my carnivore journey. Fabulous. Yeah. That, um, I understand what you're saying because compared to some stories, your story doesn't seem spectacular, magnificent, you know, life changing, but, yeah. but it is to you. And that's the thing. It matters to you. Mental health is a serious issue. Depression is a serious issue and knee pain. See, people might be watching this thing. Oh, that's nothing. If you have it every single day, you don't realize how tiring it is, how it restricts you. And, you know, you're only 27. Imagine if that's another 30 years and you're heavier and, you know, it's more inflamed and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I'm 60, right? And, and I have, you know, got over many things once I started low carb, even at 50. But since I've been coaching, I've seen people off dialysis. I mean, I now have a kidney sort of protocol where people come to me and they're like, I'm stage five. Can I do anything? And I'm like, yeah, you can actually do something. 
and we do the success story. So I get what you're saying. And, and you'd be surprised, though, that, you know, you think, well, one of those videos is very popular, but others are just sort of there. Whereas somebody losing 90 pounds and someone very real like yourself with a couple of things, and maybe people find that more believable and that gets, you know, that gets more views. Because what you just said, you cannot not talk about it. It's really hard to not do that um, because it is so miraculous. But the majority of people don't believe it. So when it's really too good to be true, they literally don't watch sometimes because they think, oh, that they don't even give it the light of day. They don't give it 30 days or whatever. What about your friends and family? Were they really sceptical? Were they against what you were doing? Or were they supportive? I lived in Nashville, Tennessee which it's known as the music capital of the world. Despite being known as that, number one job provider there is healthcare. And so I have a lot of friends that work in healthcare. And carnivore is very counterintuitive and contradictive to healthcare and what they're you know taught in school. And so, yes, I heard it from every single angle that, right, what you're doing is bad. This isn't healthy. Just have a, have some fruits and veggies. Why can't you do, you know, and, oh, it, it, that went on for, for months. And then I'm down 70 pounds and Ray looks pretty good. Ray feels pretty good. Maybe there is something to this. Almost every single person, actually, I ended up getting blood work done in that, that, that changed the last person's mind, but almost every single person had either flipped their stance on it or was just more open to it, whether they whether they came to the conclusion that, hey, this is great long-term, or at the very minimum, this can be a very useful tool in the short term. And ended up getting blood work done, and one of my buddy's wives, she's a, a very caring person, and she was convinced that I would drop dead if I didn't have some kind of fiber and antioxidants, fill in the blank. And would just never hear it got to a point where it's like it's not even fun being around you anymore because this is all you want to talk about i don't i don't care but this is you know it's the only thing that you want to talk about and at my one year mark i ended up having blood work done and i shared it with social media and she was thrilled with it and so it's it's been funny to see the this is really bad to maybe it's not so bad to hey how do i how do i if I, if I wanted to do this, how would I do it? Um, it, it cracks me up. It gives me a tickle. Yeah. And I like what you said about your friend's wife was a caring person, because this is what I try to get across to people. When people are down on the kind of diet, more often than not, it's coming from a good place that is misinformed rather than from just out and out anger or being malicious. Because your friends want you to look great, don't they? They want you to be healthy. And if they truly believe that fiber is essential and you're not having any, they're going to worry about you and they're going to do everything. So uh, you don't know me that well. Um, I spent over a decade with a private blood testing lab doing labs for people. So I'm really interested. What was she looking for in the bloods that would prove her right and what, what actually happened that proved it proved you right, you right, and that could stop a worry. And what was it? Yeah, I did a number of tests from glucose to a full comprehensive panel, um, testosterone. I did cholesterol. I did all of it. And it, everything, it minus cholesterol, and then my, my creatinine was just a little bit high, but everything was in completely normal range. In, or, or exceedingly in, you know, things that you want low, just at, at just about as low as they could be. And so you compare that with just about most humans, at least in the United States, that's fantastic blood work. At cholesterol, I know why I'm thrilled with it. You know, my HDL, I think it's 80, 83. My LDL, I think it was one, 173. And then triglycerides were like a 50, 53. Wow, that's good. Yeah. And, and I was thrilled with that. But, you know, people see total cholesterol or they see LDL and see he's going to he's gonna croak, he's going to die. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. we'll just have to agree to disagree. Yeah. 
And to be fair, I'm, I would like to think I'm a rational thinker. If a doctor, which there's been, <laughs> there's been many of them who will, who will use my content to, to create their own content, they have backing to talk about this. I don't. I have my own experience and I have the experience of thousands of others and it's all anecdotal. And so that'll forever be the crutch that people will lean on that, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's a fair statement. I have zero credentials to talk about this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, they did a lot of research, paid a lot of money to do the research and be told what's true. And I did a lot of research for free and came up with my own conclusions, which I wish, I wish that was the end goal for, for folks that go into that profession is, Hey, here's, here's how you research and, and come up with conclusions on your own. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the biggest problem in the world right now when it comes to healthcare is, and I know you're not going to understand this if, when I first start, but you will by the end, is evidence-based. They say it's evidence-based and, and it's all based on studies and trials, right? Now, in the old days, before the 1950s, it was clinical experience. What you observed, observation, was really the key thing. So uh, I'm a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes. I have an honours degree in physiology and health sciences. I've studied this for a long time. My first five years in rehab with real people and uh, working with diabetics, the standard of care let them down, absolutely let them down. And everything that I was told was patently not true. And the only patients that were doing well in my practice were the ones that were ignoring me. Now, after five years, I I had to wake up. And that is clinical experience. That's however you want to word it, anecdotal. But if you've got 10, 15 people coming in every month and they are the ones doing the best and your evidence-based research says they shouldn't be, well, after a while, you've got to say to yourself, what I've learned is BS. It's really that simple. And and if if I look in, say, Britain, which is where I'm from, obviously, if you know what I mean, right old London, um, we never used to have many diabetic people. That was it. In the 80s, even in the 80s, we would still call it late onset diabetes. It wasn't diabetes type 1, type 2, although, yeah, obviously those things exist. But... It was unusual and it was always late in your adult life. Now, that's that was the reality. Now the reality is that children are getting it. So something's changed mm-hmm. and it isn't the science. It's, it's it, that's right. What is right is looking at people, looking at actual people. So and it, this anecdote thing is a thing used by the pharmaceutical companies to, to beat down people that say, well, I don't need your medication because I've reversed type 2 diabetes by reducing my carbohydrates, which, you know, I have over a thousand people who have done this. Now, that's data. Actually, that becomes data. Um, I don't present them as case studies or as clinical, uh, you know, case studies or anything like that. I mean, obviously, I have their bloods and I have their own testimonies and before and after pictures. But Western A. Price, you know, when he was going around looking at why people were healthy, he used photographs and he said photos are worth a thousand words. You know, one photo is worth a thousand words. And he's got photos upon photos of people with really healthy teeth saying they don't even brush their teeth. Look at these jaws. They're fabulous. Well, that's that's convincing. So I'd, I, I'm i with you. Just personal experience. You know, you can be a PhD and an idiot and there are plenty out there. So uh, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, that's why I didn't go any further than my honours degree, because I just thought actually what I learn with real people makes much more sense to me. It's it's what the end goal is, isn't it? I mean, that's the whole point. The end goal is to be healthy. And- I completely agree. It, it, in, even if we do want to classify something as anecdotes, when you talk about, like you said, okay, you have over a thousand results just from yourself. And there's countless more out there. I, I promise you, there's countless more. Mm. Sure, it's anecdote. Sure, we haven't sat down and, and done a, a peer-reviewed case study on this. But anecdotes are suggestive of something. And anecdotes are what leads us to study something. And it, it, it infuriates me that this hasn't been looked at more. That it's just dismissed. It's just, well, no, it's bad because of this. And it's, it, 
I, I assume that we would agree quite a bit that even the studies that do exist on, let's say, red meat, red meat's bad for you. Hmm. Is it what was in those studies? You know, how how well were those studies crafted, and you know, was there any ulterior motive to those studies? And it is seeing how many people it's helped, and seeing how many people are just blatantly against it. I I, I get it initially. I think when somebody first hears about it and has a, a harsh reaction against it, I think that's completely logical. That, that that was my own conclusion when I first heard about it. But if you just sit and do just a little bit of research, true research, I think many would come to the conclusion that at the minimum, okay, I don't know if it's great long term, but at the minimum, this this could be really good short term. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's that's how I live. I mean, it, it does seem like common sense when you look at fruit and veg, for instance, and it's all earthy and, you know, it's, it's in a sort of wicker basket and it's covered in greenery and all this. Oh, that's got to be good for you. That has got to be good for you. But, of course, what we're forgetting is that even if we take fruit, for instance, it is now a hybrid. It is not the fruit even 50 years ago. You know, the nutrient deficiency in food since the 1950s has been studied left, right and centre. Um, you know, things like calcium declining from 1930 to 1980 in veg, down 20%, iron down 22%, potassium down 14%. I've just got the figures in front of me. You know, if you look at the um, Department of Ag Agriculture data, 43 garden crops from 1950 to 1999, reliably there have been declines in 6 nutrients in all foods protein calcium potassium iron, uh, iron riboflavin and vitamin c so that you can get this everywhere you can get the actual um details about fruit and veg have lost lost mainly most of their nutrients and mm. one that hasn't that much is grass-fed beef that's still there it's, just, it's very nutrient dense and it's it is good for you you mentioned studies that say red meat are bad is bad for you. But well, I've actually taken part in one of those studies because I wanted to see it firsthand because I'm one of those people that I want to know before I talk about these things publicly, I want to know. So I signed up for a study and uh, I did their questionnaire. And when it asked me if I ate red meat, I asked the person there, the, the adjudicator sort of guy in the white coat with the clipboard, well, I do eat red meat. Yeah, I do. But I don't eat processed meat. I don't eat hot dogs. I don't eat hamburgers. So is there a place on this questionnaire where I can do that? No, no. Absolutely no. All of that is... So that basically most studies do actually say, like, any any red meat, whatever it's in, like pizza, and that's definitely... You can look at the study in depth and you'll find that red meat, they never study fresh red meat. They never study it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I don't want to get into that. I, I really wanted to do your story, but I mean, you brought that up, and I think maybe your viewers have never seen me before when I know what I've got to say as well. But uh, Ray, so you have done this for a year, and you've seen these remarkable improvements. You've got you know hundreds of hundreds of thousands of followers now, I believe. You know, which is great. So it shows that it's resonating, and you're getting people saying, "Oh, it's worked for me." So um, what's currently going on in your life when it comes to carnival? Yeah. So recently I've started, I've started experimenting of adding in fruits and really the heart behind this is just kind of how I've talked about carnivore from the beginning. I think there's a few percentage of people that, Hey, they need to do carnivore otherwise their life's completely in shambles now i think the vast majority of humans if not all humans would thrive carnivore but it, as far as hey we have to be and you know we can't ever do anything else I, I just don't think that's true clearly if somebody can live 70 years on a standard american diet it's not true you know and i'm not I'm not advocating for that because i I lived a good portion of my my young years on the standard American diet. It's not worth it, you know. It's not worth the the palatable food. But I kind of just wanted to demonstrate, 
what I've said from the beginning of, hey, if you did this, did it for a month, did it for a few months, developed a baseline for feeling really good because most that do it, at least for, I would say ideally three months. I always say one month, try it for a month because us humans, we're just so, we can't wrap our minds around doing something or three months without ever having a cheat, which is just mind boggling. And, and I used to be one of those people, but I would tell them if you did it for this period of time, and then if you just slowly added foods in, okay, today I'm just doing strawberries or today I'm, I don't know, some carnivores do cheese, some don't, but I'm going to include cheese or milk or shoot, try, try the veg. And if you did it slowly and kind of just identified, okay, I feel better. I feel the same or I feel worse. If I feel better, the same, and this is a food that you want to keep in, keep it in. You know, th there's certain foods that that light up our taste buds, that that bring people joy. Food is a social thing. And so if somebody can, I use this example. You ever walk into a bakery? It smells amazing. It smells really good. If somebody thrives eating fresh baked bread, I would say eat the bread. Like if you physically, mentally, emotionally feel really good eating bread and you enjoy that, that's a joy that, hey, ex experience it. My goal is not to convert the world to carnivore. I sleep no better or worse if there's more or less carnivores in the world. <laughs> you know, I, I know what's worked for me and I know what's worked for many others. But for me to have said, slowly add foods back in, slowly add foods back in. And I just hadn't done it at this point. This is a self-experiment of, hey, do I do I feel better adding fruits in or honey or eventually I'll do grains? And what I've experienced so far, so, so the foods I've had in, just to give you the backstory, it's been honey, it's been kiwi, it's been avocado, strawberries and raspberries and I'm on, I'm on week two of this there's been pros and cons so, so the pros i'll start with the pros that i've experienced first thing growing up i remember hearing people say oh, i'm craving something sweet i'm gonna have a piece of fruit i remember thinking to myself this person's nuts yeah like fruit's sweet but it's not it's not this herb you know it's not it's not ice cream it's you know it's not a piece of cake or pie and biting into a piece of fruit after an entire year without consuming any sugar. Holy smokes, this is candy. Same, same with honey. And to, so, so there's the sense of joy that the food brings in that. So, so I, I would say that's a pro or that many people would consider a pro. Um, going to restaurants. There's a lot of times that restaurants just won't let you substitute one of their sides for more meat. It's, you got to order the whole meal and we'll bring you, you know, a quarter of it. And that's, that's your, that's your plate, but you're, you're paying full price. And so yeah, restaurants will let you substitute whatever the site is for their fruit. And so somebody who's very frugal, I hate spending, I hate wasting money. That, that makes me feel like I'm not being scammed when I'm sitting down in a restaurant. So there's that. And then the, the third pro I would say is that it's just, fun. It's just kind of, it's fun. I guess it ties in with that, that first, that first pro of the, the joy you experience. You just, it, it's, it's fun to have a diverse diet. I'll say that. And this is coming from somebody who loves carnivore. Like I, I can eat a bowl of ground beef and eggs every single day and be content for the rest of my life. You throw in a ribeye steak every once in a while, holy smokes, life is good. Life's real good. But being somebody that's loved carnivore, because some get bored with it, I've I've loved it from day one. I would say it is fun having sweeter whole foods in there. I have experienced some cons as well though. And so nothing nothing major, you know, nothing that if I'm just a, an average person, it, nothing, I haven't experienced anything that ooh. I can't have this. I'm not in shambles. My depression hasn't creeped back in. My knee pain's still gone. I haven't experienced any of those. But as somebody who loves to steward his time very well, I'm very intentional with time. We don't get more time. Each second that goes by, it's never coming back. And so I want to do everything 
the most efficient way possible. On carnivore, that happens. Every aspect of life, you are efficient. And it's one of my greatest joys of carnivore is that I can go work for 12, 14 hours straight if I need to and be just fine. There's a few things that kind of disrupt that, including including the fruits and honey so far. So number one, my meals are smaller, but I eat more often. Strict carnivore, I'll eat once or twice a day. And I love it because it's it's just so simple. You eat for 10, 15 minutes, then boom, back to whatever you need to get done. Versus including these fruits, you really, I guess you'd call it an animal-based diet, would be kind of the, the coined term in today's world. But having to make time to eat three, four, five times a day, wake up, okay, I'm hungry. Go to the gym, I feel like I need to eat before the gym. That's another thing. Love working out fast and have done that forever. Carnivore especially, thrive working out fasted. Since including these fruits, if I don't eat something before I go to the gym, I feel just dead. Like I, I need to consume my energy right now. It's not just free flowing in my body. But after the gym, okay, I'm hungry again. It's lunchtime. I'm hungry again. I could do another snack. Okay. Dinner time. Okay. Should I have a couple more fruit pieces of fruit before bed? It, it, it takes up so much time of just eating, you know, three, four, five, six times a day. So there's that piece. Bowel movements, which some people would say TMI, but I've had, I don't know how many people message me about this very thing. So I'm sharing it myself. Carnivore, great bowel movements once a day, very, very regimented routine. This time of day I go, including fruits, three times a day. Again, not the end of the world. It's not you know, something that should make somebody's quality of life go up or down. But as somebody who just is really intentional with stewarding his time and wants to be efficient with everything, I find it really annoying if I'm working and, okay, got to go to the bathroom for the second time today. Okay, got to go to the bathroom for the third time today. It drives me nuts. And then the, you know, I would say this is the biggest one that makes me excited to get back to strict carnivore. As somebody who's active and, and really likes to work out on strict carnivore. I won't say I never get sore because there's times, if, I mean, I got to really push myself to feel some kind of soreness. But for most of the time, I don't really get sore. And then when I do, it's just not that bad. You know, I'm not bracing myself to, you know, sit on the, sit on the toilet. Sugar, holy smokes. Every, every muscle in my body aches. I'm like, I didn't even know I had these muscles. Like, what, why am I sore? And it, I believe it's strictly the sugar. And so that, that piece right there gets me excited to go back to strict carnivore. But if I'm the average person and going back to why I'm doing this experiment, for some people living an efficient lifestyle 24-7, they don't care about that. And that's okay. Nobody, I don't think everybody has to think the way that I do or, or try to maximize everything like I do. And if I did think that, best of luck to me because that's just not going to happen. There's a lot of lazy people in the world. Some people, they just want to eat and be fat and be happy. And if that's their goal, but they still wanted to feel good, I would say what I've experienced so far for the average person, I'd probably keep these foods in. And then my, my theory... Because I'll eventually get to grains, you know, stuff like that. I'm thinking that's where I may experience knee pain again. I may experience, you know, okay, what's going on? Do I need to do some counseling or something? Um, just a theory. I could be wrong. But I tell you, it's very funny to see the internet react. Because I, I, I thought I've been clear, which you can never be too clear. But I thought I've been clear about how I would do carnivore, you know, if somebody was curious about doing it and and it's just the slowly adding foods back in. And every platform has responded kind of differently. TikTok, see carnivore's bad, he's adding foods back in. Instagram, surprisingly, very supportive of just curious about this experience uh, or experiment. Facebook, this guy's dumb. Don't eat fruit. 
don't eat fruits, bad fat. You're, you're going to get fat again. It, and, and just watching the responses of everybody, it, it's, it's comical. And it's a reminder that you truly can't please anybody. And I guess what I eat really impacts other people's day. It's crazy, isn't it? How um, wedded some people are to opinions because you're very clear that it's an experiment. Uh, I was sort of glad that you were actually into it when uh, when I realized that you'd booked this interview, that you'd started it because uh, yeah. you have feedback now. And that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point. If we'd have done this interview and you're about to go into it, you'd have nothing to say. And you wouldn't have pros and cons and you wouldn't have things for people to ruminate on. So all those platforms, all those people are just, they're looking for an echo chamber to back up their opinion. They're not saying, hey, this guy's open-minded. He's doing something that he doesn't necessarily know is going to be good or bad because he wants to know. After a year of carnivore and resetting his levels of inflammation, blood glucose, insulin, whatever, how will these things affect me? Which is Which is... A brilliant experiment. It's really that simple. It is an experiment. I coach a lot of people and, um, you know, the, the, the first thing they say is, I don't really want to give up coffee. I was like, okay, right, okay. There's a lot of carnivores drink coffee um, and they don't get much grief for it. Coffee's not an animal. It's not carnivore. I said, but they also drink water. Well, that's not an animal. And they have salt. That's not an animal. So people pick and choose what is carnivore and what isn't, all right? So you're going to choose the, your carnivore journey to have an avocado, right? That's not an animal, but that's going to make you happy and uh, the coffee's going to make you happy. I'd rather you be 95% carnivore and stick with it because you can have these two or three things that you really feel like you need. And you can always, you know, uh, reassess it six months down the line. Do you really need these things? Do you really want these things? Are they beneficial? You can experiment like you're doing. Um or you can give up completely. Mm -hmm. And and that's the worst thing to say to somebody. Because if you're wedded to being strict carnival, you know, or lion or whatever it is, and that's the be all and end all, which I totally understand for people like with you know autoimmune conditions. If you look at Michaela Peterson, for instance, I think being st as strict as possible is obviously life changing for her. So possibly I wouldn't experiment if that was my client. But I think for, like you say, the average person, you know, if you visit Italy and someone says, oh, there's this woman, she's been making pasta for 50 years, it's the best pasta, and you're in, you're in Tuscany in Italy and you don't try that pasta, well, you've missed an experience that maybe would have been the best pasta you've ever tasted. It doesn't mean you're going to go home and have tons of pasta. So I think it's about living your life and being open-minded and accepting. I mean, I cringed as you saw when you mentioned grains, because I think fruit and honey and then that step to grains might be very interesting. Uh, I, it scares me. I don't really want to experiment myself anymore. I've done all the experiments and I think I would really struggle because porridge was my downfall, one of my downfalls, or oatmeal as the Americans call it. Um, you know, I was, uh, just for people that don't know me, that's from your channel, I was an advanced personal trainer. I actually trained someone to get to the Olympics, um, not the, the Olympics now, but, you know, in my 40s and 50s, who was a type 1 diabetic. That's how I got involved because I had the diabetes specialism and also the advanced personal training certificate. And I was really active. I'm not saying that to show off. I was really active myself, ex, you know, ex soccer player. I've won a tennis tournament. So I was moving lots. I was running three times a week. All those medals are for running. And I was still getting tubbier and I was still pre-diabetic. And I was doing, you know, I should have been the poster boy for the food guidelines because I was having grains. I was having skim milk. I was having freshly squeezed orange juice, fruit and veg. And I was getting tubbier, pre-diabetic, lower left quadrant pain, coronary artery calcium scan of 639. You know? Wow. Now, uh, you're pretty young. I mean, I'm nearly twice your age and... The longer you do these things, the more it accumulates. So, for instance, with the bloods, um, you can spot someone's going to be diabetic not by their blood glucose, actually, by their background insulin. So you could be looking at your blood glucose monitor, and this is for this is for people, maybe for yourself, actually, Ray. I don't know if you even thought about this, but 
your blood glucose could be perfect. And you could be saying, hey, eating fruit and honey is great. Look at my blood glucose. It's fantastic. Yeah, well, what's your insulin doing? Um, normally, when we go back over data, we can see a trend. So someone's blood glucose is, is, is pretty good. But in the background, the insulin's need to do that is higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And this is maybe over 15 years. Mm-hmm. And then the pancreas just cannot produce that amount of insulin. So the insulin production drops and the blood glucose goes up. And wow, this person is possibly diabetic. So you could have had that 15 years ago. You could have predicted it. So I think... These experiments are fabulous, you know, fabulous. I'll really take my hat off to you. And uh, by the way, I love the T-shirt. It's got Butterboy written on it, which is good merch. Um, And I think people getting angry don't understand because you have now already, as a very fit, reasonably young person doing carnivore for a year, given us some pros and cons that will help people. Oh, wow. You know, and, and also you're not wedded to this way of living. You You're not making tons of money out of, recommending fruits or honey you're doing it as an experiment and you found some things that you know would put me off as well because i like working out so body aches would make me go well if that's only in like a few weeks and it's bought that and this is true when i have experimented when i bought fruit back um even some dairy i bought back a couple of years ago i bought back yogurt and wow it really impacted my muscles because i don't cope well with dairy liquid dairy that is cheese i do all right with so yeah, it, it it does light up the internet when you do something. Uh, I'm not a fan of fruit and honey. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows my channel. Uh, I think long term, it's probably not the best thing to do. But a little bit, if it's going to keep you carnivore, then I'm all for it. I'm, it's just, I think it's the degree, like, you, you know, you're eating more often, so you're raising your insulin more often. Yes, your meals are smaller, but you're spiking your insulin more often, which is not the greatest thing on to do but I, I i take my hat off to you i think it's brilliant what you're doing and being so open and transparent and look at us we're talking about pros you know i love what you said F- fruit is not pie fruit is candy that uh, that's the other thing your sensitivity to sweetness when you go carnival wow that goes through the roof and i can d- give your viewers a real you, you know your followers they might have heard this you know before I did low carb, I could not eat dark chocolate. It was like, how on earth can anyone put that in their mouth? That that has nothing going for it. Nothing. It's horrible. Uh, and and now my, you know, if I have a square of dark chocolate, it has to be ninety percent. Has to have z- virtually zero chocolate uh, of yep. sugar. I mean, and it's sweet. You know, it's it's really sweet. If someone says, "Oh, this is eighty five percent." This can't be too sweet for you. It, it 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 actually is. So you become much more aware of how sweet things are. And yeah, that fruit is really really sweet, isn't it? Really sweet. It's incredibly sweet. Talking about the the insulin. So yeah, I I decided to do this maybe a week ago. But whenever I finish this experiment, I'm gonna have blood work done again because with the um, with the results that I'd gotten, my insulin um probably can't see this well, but on a scale from 2.6 to 24.9, I was a 5.7. Yeah, I don't think I can see it. Okay. Very thrilled with it. Very, Mm -hmm. very low. And C-reactive point, uh, C-reactive protein was at a 0.22, the lowest. Wow. Something that quite a few people had issues with um, and these are people that are reaching, I mean, really just reaching, mm-hmm. was that my my hemoglobin A1C was at a 5.5, in, mm-hmm. um, at least in the U.S., 5.7 is considered pre-diabetic. Yep. And there was one other area, apart from the cholesterol, I think it was glucose. It was... On a normal scale of 65 to 99, I was in 96. Mm-hmm. And the reach that, that you know, the, the people that are very anti-carnivore, see, he's almost pre-diabetic. It, it's, it's about to get bad. It's about to get bad. And I'm looking at my metabolic health, which is phenomenal, according to this blood work. For granted, I'm somebody that thinks that multiple blood work reports is a true indicator of health. I don't think one... This is the only blood work I've ever had done. 
And so there's nothing for me to reference it to, whether it got better or worse. I'm going to confidently assume that it had gotten better, considering there's a history of diabetes in my family and considering that I was obese and just carrying around a ton of extra weight, considering I I wasn't binging on fruit, but I was binging on pints of ice cream. I'm assuming that my hemoglobin A1C is just now finally getting into normal ranges. And so, again, I don't know that this is, this is a guess. This isn't a factual statement. But if I had to wager who I was one year ago, I bet I was pre-diabetic. It, it makes absolute sense to me. And so I'm, I'm curious to see what will happen to my blood work introducing these foods. Yeah. I mean, the HPA1C is a very, very poor marker, especially when you're low-carb keto carnivore. Uh, just to explain why. Um, it's a calculation, and it's based on an assumption of how long your red blood cells last. It's not a direct measurement as such. Um, a much better marker of how you're coping is fasted glucose, fasted insulin, and C-peptide. That, that is the thing. So people with a continual glucose monitor that I coach will always say, I don't get it. When they first meet me, they first deal with me, I don't understand. My continual glucose monitor shows an average, but my HbA1c is higher. And I say that's because it's a flawed metric because it's 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 thinking that your red blood cells are going to last X amount of days depending on which lab you go to. And you can prove that your red blood cells are lasting longer on carnivore. You can do what's called a reticular site count. And that proves that your red blood cells are lasting longer. And that completely throws out the HbA1c which is why you get the anomaly of somebody who's got very low glucose, very low C-peptide, very low fasted insulin, has an artificially high HbA1c. When I first did my phlebotomy, that, you know, like I say, because I did the private bloods for, for over a decade, you actually are told if someone's hemolytic anemic, which is your red blood cells die too soon, you have to ignore their HbA1c because it's artificially low. And this is how, you know, I, I'm a great believer in joined up thinking. So I was already told this officially. Not many people know that the normative ranges in bloods are not based on carnivore, keto, low carb or optimal health. They're just normative ranges based on people in, the, in general eating 40 to 65% carbohydrates. And there's no nuance to it, none whatsoever. So anyway, my thinking was, oh, I remember that. Well, you know, the hemolytic anemic people, I had to say your HbA1c, we can't use because your red blood cells are dying too soon. Well, what would be the opposite? Well, your red blood cells living longer than the calculation would give you an artificially high HbA1c, so we need to ignore it. And that's all fact. That's all, that's all absolute fact. You can prove it with the reticular site count. The other thing is what the HbA1c isn't measuring is, is the damage and the glycation from fructose. So with mm. fruit, for instance, uh, fructose, because of the fructans and, um, and many other things, they're 11 times more glycating and they produce more fat in the liver, which is why we've got this prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Because that fructose and anything that's sweet and potentially toxic, the body will make into fat. That's what happens. So the whole diabetic thing... Um, I'm going to now make sense of all the diabetic symptoms and you'll go, oh, this all makes total sense. Unbelievable thirst is one of the one of the signs. If you're out there and you don't know if you're diabetic, the first thing is you will be very thirsty. Well, that's your body being smart and saying, right, we've got this uh, concentration of sugar in our blood, which is too high. Let's dilute it. Total sense, right? So yeah, so you drink a load of water. What's the next thing when you drink a load of water? You excrete it. So you have this very toxic substance in your urine which is the actual definition of what a translation of diabetes mellitus is sweet piss. I mean, that's how they used to test in the old days. Sorry to swear if your people on your channel don't like swearing. I don't really, but that's what it translates to. So the body, you drink a lot, you dilute it, you have too much uh, blood sugar, you're going to excrete it out. Your body deals with blood sugar in all these different ways. And people say, well, why do, why do carbohydrates turn to fat? Because carbohydrates are sugar, they're toxic, so the body is really smart and turns it to fat. Mm. Same with the HbA1c. It's, it, you have to just think about what is the logic of it. Well, the logic is it does this reading, but instead of saying here's a reading, 
how long did your red blood cells last so we can then sort of uh, adjust it to, to give you some sort of reference range. They don't do that. They just say, no. you're in this, it's high. I'm not saying to people ignore it, but definitely know why it goes up. There's also reasons why your blood glucose on carnivore goes really high. This isn't about me, by the way. Um, so if you want to come back or you want to talk to me in private about it or get me on your channel or whatever, I'm, I'm happy to go through all this. I did write a book about it, by the way, if people are interested. So the Guide to Blood Tests in the context of this way of eating. Um, the normal ranges, the ones that are always controversial are all the ones that are calculated. So HbA1c, calculated. LDL, calculated. EGFR, the filtration rate of the kidney. You mentioned creatinine. That goes up because that is a waste product of protein metabolism. Go on any nursing website, and uh, I noticed I didn't say doctor's website, but if you go on any nursing website that deals with phlebotomy, and they talk about the, your EGFR going up, the first question they say to ask the patient is, do you eat a lot of protein? That's it. So it's known that protein will increase creatinine. Uh, and like I say, I've had so many success stories with people with kidney problems and also taking a different test. So if you f feel like your filtration rate is reflected badly, get the cystatin C test. And that will make a difference because that's a proper measurement of filtration of your kidney. So blood's really, sorry, uh, it's sort of triggered me a little bit, as you can tell. Um, bloods are not the be-all and end-all, but you you finish with the best thing. It's about clinical presentation, how you feel. I've had people with perfect bloods, in inverted commas, and at the end of going through the bloods, I say, how do you feel? And they say, absolutely terrible. Oh, man, I can't sleep. I've got aches and pains, such and such. Or I can have someone come in and they can have, you know, the worst bloods, allegedly, that you've ever seen. Yeah. And they say to me, I feel better than I did when I was 20. You know, they're for like 45 or something. Oh, wow, I'm getting clothes I haven't been able to get into for 10 years. I just can't believe the energy I've got. My brain fog's gone. So mm -hmm. bloods, they're, I'm not knocking them. That They are a very good tool for uh, diagnosis of many things. But but biohacking, they are certainly not, certainly not in this space. So um, anyway, so I'm having a bit of a long thing there. Sorry about that, right? I love what you said about the, the blood work too, where, where you'll see people that, you know, according to standards, the, okay, their blood work's not good according to the, this set of measures, but they feel better than they've ever felt, or they feel, you know, decades younger than they actually are. I can't tell you how many people that have told me, because I've said that too, I feel better than I've ever felt. Well, that doesn't mean you're healthy. <laughs> okay, fair, but... I'd still rather feel this way. If I was the opposite, you gave me perfect blood work, but hey, Ray, we'll give you perfect blood work, but you got to be depressed for the rest of your life and you got to have some really bad joint pain for the rest of your life. I'd say, no, thank you. Mm. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I actually, in our community, I run a small, a small sort of kind of a community with my uh, co-host, Richard Smith, and one of the people had the question, virtually what you just said, we did a live Q&A and it said, what would you rather have? Perfect bloods, but feel real bad or feel real good and have very bad bloods. And I said, you've got to think about this differently. I'm, I, I'm not ducking the question, but I'm telling you, if you feel really good, your bloods aren't bad. Mm -hmm. You're being told they're bad. Yeah. Those bloods are suitable for your body. You can't, you can't ignore certain diseases and conditions, genetic conditions and stuff like that. But for 98% of the population, that holds true. Because I've had people that are allegedly hypoglycemic out working in the forest, you know, moving logs around. Wow. Not hypoglycemic. They have they operate with lower blood sugar. There, there, there is more to the uh, slightly raised glucose. That I, I, I don't want it, this... this be about me so I love you know, maybe we do up <laughs> yeah or we can talk later it doesn't yeah. matter well i mean i'll touch on it then I, I didn't want to take the thunder from you but your blood glucose what um insulin and the receptors do is they speed up the entry of sugar into your cells by about ten thousand times all right but, but you don't actually have to have those receptors but it's incredibly slow and we wouldn't do very well so you get what's called diffusion one of the things happen when you eat this way 
you have lower levels of insulin, you have lower levels of uh, GLUT4 transporters uh, translocating to the membrane, they stay inside the cell. So we have slightly higher levels of glucose because all of our mechanisms are taking a day off. They're just relaxing. If you did suddenly eat um, some fruit, wow, your cephalic response goes, wow, this is this is sweet. Your tongue goes, wow, this is sweet. And you get a reaction. You'd absolutely get a reaction from your pancreas and you get the insulin that is appropriate for the sweetness. And that's what's gone wrong. And the modern way of eating is... You get a ton of sweetness, which is hidden. So you take like a McDonald's milkshake. I'm sure neither of us would. Well, why do they add salt? They add salt to a milkshake to make it less sweet, but the sweetness is still there. Mm. The sugar's still there. So they add salt to it to make it less sweet. Well, just think about that. When that gets into your body, your body doesn't go, this is great. There's not much sugar because that salt's hiding it. It just goes, all right, here's some salt. We're going to move that over there. Oh, here's some sugar. Wow, well, that's in the bloodstream. We've got to, we've got to deal with that. And, and this is it. It's all about getting, getting back to whole foods, getting back to, to um, eating things that we're meant to eat, yeah. that's unadulterated. You, you know, like an apple, for instance, you took that fruit. If you get it from a supermarket, that was picked over a year ago in my supermarkets, and I've got this from the food growers themselves, from PDFs of of their practices. Well, that's not fresh. That's not really? fresh fruit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're in controlled environments and with gas and, uh, you know, different things, uh, a coating put on them. Oh, yeah, I, I've, I've done a video about fruit and veg, and I used all the producer's details to give you the facts. So, like, pears, I think the average was eight months from being picked to actually being on the supermarket shelf. Well, I've got an apple tree, right? I have no compunction telling people this. I will pick an apple or I'll eat an apple. I would not from a supermarket. What happens within six weeks, the the, uh, alleged nutrients that are in that fruit will have gone within six weeks in that controlled environment. So um, anyway, (laughs) looks like you're going to have to watch that video. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to find it when we're done. Yeah, it's it. and that's that's the thing. It, if I was a hunter gatherer and I went past a a a bush that had blueberries on or blackberries, I would eat them. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That's yeah. that's fine. That's that makes sense. If there's a scarcity of food, why would you not eat them? Yeah, it makes no sense to ignore food that's free and there for you to give you a little boost of energy. But boy, that that's not going to be there. 24-7, 365 days of the year. That's going to be seasonal. It's going to be based, you know, what fruit I eat is going to be based on where I live. Mm. You know, so there's there's so much nuance to all of this. I mean, fruit and honey is not a 24-7, 365-day fruit in, in the first place. Right. Um, so, yeah. But, Ray, let's get back to you. <laughs> so what do you see yourself doing then? Do you really feel you're going to be brave and try grains in the future? For the experiment, yes. Now, I, I'm, I'm really not looking forward to it because it, 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 the fruit's been fun to experiment with. Okay, to not have any severe adverse reactions. It, again, it, it did have some cons, but those aren't life changing cons. The knee pain, I, I dread the idea of ever having joint pain without good reason. Again. Because for over a decade, I just thought, oh, this is early onset arthritis. And, you know, maybe at 40, 50 years old, I'll have a knee replacement. That's what doctors told me. It was diet, inflammation, gone within three days. And so the idea of it coming back now, I'm, I am, I do take comfort in the idea that, okay, if it did, right back to carnivore goes right, right away again. That's a that's a, a strong comfort pill for me. The mental health. I'm not excited about that. Even if it is just for a few days of, yeah, I feel horrible. I'm gonna stop this immediately. And then I experience, you know, brain fog or depression or knee pain for a few days. I'm not excited about those few days. It, and you said that you were a porridge person, uh, an oatmeal person. I've never loved oatmeal, hot hot cereal, you know, it's Another thing that we'll call it here in the States, but I'd rather have a bowl of ultra processed cereal. You know, that's, 
And, and these, those aren't the foods I'll experiment with. That, that is not at all. That is not at all my intention. I'm strictly experimenting with whole foods because I believe that at the minimum, if somebody's not going to be carnivore or at least predominantly meat, eat whole foods. If it grows or, you know, barks or not, not barks, but moos or, you know, if, it, if it's a living thing, eat that. And so I am nervous strictly for the advert, the potential adverse side effects, but I'm just, I'm excited to get back to carnivore. It's just so much more simpler. It's also very cost effective, which I think is funny. And I've said this from the beginning, I, I've been saving money eating carnivore since adding fruits and vegetables. It's freaking ex not vegetables, but it, it is expensive. It's expensive. I've gone to the grocery store probably five times in the last, what, week and a half, two weeks of doing this. It's more time out of my day. It's annoying. If I want it fresh, you know, I want it, you know, quote unquote organic or, you know, get the high quality, high quality fruits. You can't just buy a whole bunch and, you know, leave it sitting out on the counter. You got to continually do it. And so I'm, I'm very excited to get back to full carnivore. It, it just makes, it makes life simpler. I'm excited to get back into my, my gym training schedule and not feel like I am overly sore in everything of even just moving around or sitting or even just sitting right here. I feel like I, I need to go stretch my legs. We've only been talking for an hour. Mm -hmm. That's not carnivore. I can sit for hours on end. Not that anybody should, but I, I can if I need to. And yeah, I, I this soreness is the biggest thing that makes me excited to go back. Well, Ray, thanks so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Of course.